Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and in this video, I'm going to continue my discussions about abrupt climate system change. So human activities are the source of excess greenhouse gases in the atmosphere over and above their pre-industrial levels, in particular CO2 and methane, but also things like nitrous oxide. This excess leads to a heat imbalance for the Earth's system where the heat input is rising faster than the heat output. This in turn leads to temperature rise. Okay, but how fast is this rise? And, uh, you know, we like to think in terms of um, linear thinking, you know, most of us think if something happened, then it'll continue to happen. And, you know, gradualistic small changes, not abrupt changes. So, People are generally surprised when something is happening abruptly or very, very fast. And clearly this is a big thing in the scientific community where things are always happening much faster than expected. You know, Google uh, climate change faster than expected and you get gazillions of hits. Google climate change proceeding as expected or slower than expected and you get nothing. So clearly the scientific uh, community and reporting on climate change is completely conservative, completely behind the eight ball. So let's talk about the chain of events in the Earth's system. So we have an excess of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so there's extra heat to the planet, input, an extra heat input to the planet, so average temperatures rise. Now the land heats faster than the oceans because the oceans have a huge thermal heat capacity. So we get these shifts in climate with um, a much greater frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events. So for example, we get more intense monsoons. As the land heats very quickly, the air rises over the land, creates a low pressure area, sucks in moist air from the surrounding oceans where there's more evaporation because it's hotter and the water is hotter. This water vapor goes into the atmosphere and as it rises, it cools and condenses and forms water droplets and releases its latent heat energy. This latent heat energy fuels the storms. So there's more energy for these storms because there's more water vapor. There's more energy for hurricanes and typhoons, more storm damage and more refugees, climate refugees. Droughts and heat waves are more severe. But do you call this abrupt climate change? Right? Is this abrupt or is this this gradualistic change? So when we talk about global warming in the past, present, or the next few decades, um, you know, we can talk about the different components to that warming. You know, some places are becoming unbearably hot or having intolerable droughts. Some islands are being ravaged by ever worse hurricanes or typhoons, making threatening to make them uninhabitable or very miserable places to live. Otherwise, changes to many countries are generally seemingly manageable, but this is changing rapidly. Things are spiraling out of control. The Arctic is a huge source of changes to the rest of the planet. It's having huge impacts. The, the Arctic temperature amplification has disrupted circulation patterns in both the oceans and the atmosphere, and it's having a huge impact on weather extremes in the northern hemisphere, mid-latitudes, um, most noticeably, but not just there. So there's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, extra heat input to the planet, average temperature of the planet rises. Now, in terms of the surface water that enters the Arctic, the temperature is hotter of this water. So there's all this heat being Im exported up into the Arctic, exported from the Pacific Ocean and Atlantic Ocean surrounding at lower latitudes surrounding the Arctic. It's exported north going right into the Arctic causing tremendous heating there. The original heating in the Arctic is from the, it being darker. The albedo is dropping. The average albedo in the Arctic has decreased from 52 percent to 48 percent in about three decades according to series uh, data from NASA. Um, so when the Arctic heat input rises above a critical threshold, then the positive albedo effect dominates over negative radiative feedback. When you get a warmer surface, then it radiates heat more. There's a, there's a Boltzmann factor, temperature to the fourth power factor. 
um, the Stefan Boltzmann law. So basically, this positive albedo feedback really dominates over the negative feedback, causing the snow and ice to retreat even more. So the Arctic warms much faster than lower latitudes. The temperature gradient between the Arctic and lower latitudes reduces, so the energy in the jet stream Rosby wave decreases, so the jet stream um, meanders more with more sinuosity and tends to get stuck. So there's more severe weather events in northern hemisphere mid-latitudes, more noticeably there than anywhere else. There's more severe flooding, there's longer droughts, more severe heat waves and forest fires, and there's more common extremes. Because the jet streams are so wavy, the troughs extend very far south. For example, we get cold snaps in Florida, and the ridges of these jet streams extend very far north. We get heat in the northern regions, like over Greenland. Okay, so, you know, is this really abrupt cr climate change? You know, it sort of depends on the definition. It's certainly climate change that's happening much faster than expected. However, you know, if if, and it appears by all means that we are continuing these processes, right, they won't be stopping because we're not doing anything, the effect of continued positive albedo feedback could cause the following chain of events, starting as before. More CO2, extra heat input to the planet, average temperature rises, so the surface water enter the Arctic rises, it puts these heat pulses into the Arctic, crosses the critical value, dominates over negative radiative, radiative feedback, resulting in a retreat of snow and sea ice cover. But then the retreat of sea ice cover continues, and the loss of snow cover in the spring continues. So warm Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean water will enter further and further into the Arctic Ocean the Arctic Ocean will become seasonal, seasonally free of sea ice, possibly within a few years. So we'll have this blue ocean event, no sea ice at all in the Arctic Ocean. So the Arctic Ocean will really act as an extension of the Atlantic and Pacific. The water will be much, much warmer. So instead of having cold air sitting over the Arctic, which, you know, where we have a situation of descending air, the oceans will be warmer than the continents, in the, um, in, you know, especially in, 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 the, sp in the fall, as the, as the uh, winter comes, the continents cool down quickly, the oceans will stay warm. So instead of uh, descending air, we get rising air in the Arctic. The patterns of air circulation, both locally in the Arctic and globally around the planet, including the southern hemisphere, will change. This has all the hallmarks of abrupt climate change. The familiar atmospheric circulation structure of three cells, if you like, three bands. We've got the Hadley cell from 0 to 30 degrees, we've got the Ferrell cell from 30 to 60, and the polar cell from 60 to 90. This is both in the northern and southern hemispheres. So as the temperature gets equalized with latitude um, in the northern hemisphere, the Hadley cell expands to higher and higher latitudes, and we can conceive of a situation where there's temperature equalization in the northern hemisphere that the Hadley, you know, we go to a one cell system, just like a, a huge Hadley cell extending uh, basically um, from the equator up to the, to the North Pole. I mean, that type of situation um, could occur, and we've basically gone, you know, we've completely changed to a different system. As the temperature gradient between the Arctic and the equator has been hugely reduced. So the worst still is the opportunity to refreeze the Arctic may be lost. Abrupt climate change is likely to be locked in indefinitely if we reach this situation, you know, unless we have these amazing um, uh, solar radiation management and ca carbon dioxide removal um, crash programs, unless we declare a global climate emergency, which more and more cities are doing in Canada Kingston was the latest city in the last few days to declare a global climate change emergency. We still need to work on Ottawa a lot. Now, no doubt abrupt climate changes like this have occurred in the past and were drivers of the evolution of Homo sapiens to become more adaptable to its world, to its environment. The last abrupt cooling event famously caused ice age conditions in Europe 
with the shutting down of the AMOC, the Atlantic Marinal Overturning Circulation, and the onset of the Younger Dryas 12.9 thousand years ago. The abrupt heating event at the end of the Younger Dryas has, um, had, has ominous similarities to the heating event happening now in the Arctic. What we can learn from the past is that a rise in global temperature is not as critical as the rise in Arctic temperatures and associated loss of albedo, which if not addressed will almost certainly lead to abrupt climate change with associated crop failures, famine, mass migration, and widespread conflict. Such strains on society could lead to nuclear war. Certainly there will be no escape rich and poor will suffer, although the poor always suffer disproportionately more than the rich. So the AMOC is kind of like the loose cannon. Over the past few decades, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation has been weakening, one effect of which is a rise in sea level on the east coast of the U.S. So as the AMOC slows down. As the Gulf Stream slows down, it tends to override the continental shelves on the east coast of North America, so it pushes water, warm water up there, so the effective sea level rise in those regions is much larger. Scuba divers in places like Maine, for example, have noticed that they dive down and the water temperatures are extremely warm, whereas it never used to be. It was much colder before. So the AMOC seems to have a, had a pivotal role in past climate change. A shutdown of the AMOC can result in a cooling in the northern hemisphere mid-latitudes accompanied by a heating in the southern hemisphere. But unfortunately, the effect of a partial shutdown on the Arctic Ocean, which is moving towards a seasonally ice-free state, is unknown still. You know, we can speculate, but we're not really sure the effects. It is possible that AMOC can act as a negative feedback on Arctic warming preventing the Arctic Ocean from becoming seasonally free of ice, but then causing a general cooling of northern hemisphere mid-latitudes as it shut down. On the other hand, it is possible that AMOC could add to positive feedback as the Arctic Ocean sucks warm saline water from the Atlantic and becomes seasonally free of sea ice. The, s the salty saline surface water would cool as it moved around the ocean anti-counterclockwise, anti-counter, anti-clockwise, counterclockwise, sorry, unimpeded by sea ice, then it would sink to keep the AMOC going. Northern hemisphere mid-latitudes would be, would be uh, less affected than, than if it, um, th than the other situation. So in a recent paper, Ramsdorf et al. compared models of ocean circulation which shows the AMOC changing state and exhibiting hysteresis, sort of a lagging, um, like it goes one way and then there it, it takes a different path going back. His analysis of models shows that a shutdown would occur, or could occur, when, it were a certain, when a certain amount of fresh water in the range of 0 0.15 to 0 0.5 sphere drop is added into the North Atlantic. One sphere drop is 10 to the 6 cubic meters. Um, the, um, the likely mechanism is for meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet and icebergs calving from the west coast glaciers would flood the surface of the North Atlantic, affecting the passage of warm saline water from the Gulf Stream into the Norwegian Sea and round into the place where chimneys form to, to sink cold saline water driving the thermohaline circulation. Okay, so the thermohaline circulation could be disrupted, and these things are modeled in these water hosing experience, um, experiments, modeling simulations. Okay, so sea level rise and its history. Sea level is of great concern for many countries and industries. It's a great concern for humanities. Uh, you know, many people, you know, it's prime real estate on coastlines. It's a major issue for climate restoration. To deal with it, we need to consider how sea levels have changed dramatically in the past. So during the past 2.588 million years of the Quaternary, formerly known as the Ice Ages period, there's been an ice cap on both poles. Ice has extended from the poles in many periods of glaciation with interglacial periods between them after the ice has retreated. And I'll just continue this uh, discussion